four four of this seven standby minute. Just come on. Uh, uh, what is your attack? Okay, right talk to him. See what that did. Charlie Hurst, eighty eight. Traffic two seven. Uh, 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 Eighty five just made a pass in there. Any... Uh, go ahead, two one seventy seven. Roger, sir, be advised, we have John Agrees, 2-1 okay, and 6-6 six, six standing by over our okay, I'll put it a little closer than those trees. Let me come around with a loud three, and I'll put it on those trees. There's, uh, Roger that, loud three. Randy Jane, I was a young captain, and even though I was a captain, I had just come out of pilot training because I, went, I was commissioned, went to grad school, then went to pilot training. So I'm three years older than my lieutenant friends, but I have no more experience than they do because I just finished UPT. Holy cow. And uh, what was the unit you were flying with? I was in the, the first Special Ops Squadron, the Hobos, which at that time was the last A-1 squadron. They had combined. When we would have parties, we would have guys in Zorro and Firefly party suits because they had changed down to one squadron a few months before I got there. So it was a combination of everybody yeah. at that point. And we were talking earlier, there was a point where the Air Force was really thinking about getting rid of the A-1, which created a backlog of pilots that moved elsewhere. Uh, but then when they combined everybody, you were short on pilots, correct? That's true, and, and it was, that was an interesting political debate because the Air Force was dead set on getting rid of the A-1s, and the CIA and the State Department, who were running the war in Laos, realized that that was their Air Force for their war in Laos, and they didn't want him to go away. And this is one of those things that went to the White House, went to the National Security Council, and the ruling was in favor of the State Department and CIA and against the Air Force and the Department of Defense to keep, to keep the A-1s. At that time, the Air Force was really trying to go jets, and SAC was on a, a, a rise. It was all about the nuclear yes. warfare. And that was the vision at that time. But in Southeast Asia, the A-1 pay, played a very crucial role because it was low, slow. It could, it could do the task. And that's why everybody fought for it, correct? Yes. That's why they were trying yes. to get everybody, like you were saying this morning, they wanted General Vang Pao to have his own A-1 Air Force, but you really needed that aircraft for other purposes. And, and I think we were going to talk about a certain rescue mission, a, a combat search and rescue, which is Ashcan. Uh, what was it, Ashcan? Ashcan 01. Ashcan 01. Could you lead me into that? Yeah, Ashcan was, by the time we got there, the strike F-105s had all gone home. They'd all been replaced by F-4s. But there was a significant force in Thailand of F-105G wild weasel airplanes. And these were the electronic jamming airplanes that were capable of both jamming an SA-2 SAM site and attacking it by shooting anti-radiation missiles. So if the site was tracking you with its radar, the missile basically homed on the radar antenna and, and blew it up. And so these wild weasels, which was their call sign, uh, were very integral to the strikes in North Vietnam because they were able, in some cases, to suppress the, the SAMs. And what happened was, the North Vietnamese brought SA-2s down in further into Laos and in Mugia Pass, which was only 65 miles straight east of Nakhon Phanom, even though we were in Thailand, Laos was very narrow right there. Um, I was sitting Sandy Alert as Sandy One at NKP one day at about oh, two o'clock in the afternoon when a wild weasel who was supposedly suppressing the SAM site in Mugia Pass got shot down by that SAM site. And unbeknownst to us at the time, the airplane was so badly disabled that they ended up in a high-speed dive. And the, the front seater, the pilot, and the back seater, the electronic warfare officer, ejected at very high airspeed. Uh, and on the ground, once they got down, they were, nobody could talk to him for a while, and finally the pilot came up, which was Ashcan 01 Alpha, Alpha the front seat, Bravo the back seat, uh, but nothing from Bravo, and the forward air controller that was out there was talking to the guy. So we get scrambled, and coming from NKP, we're getting there pretty quick, but we realize we're flying into an area where an SA-2 has just shot down the airplane that we're going to try to run the rescue for. 
Interesting thing about the SA-2 uh, is that it was a two-stage surface-to-air missile, and people used to describe them as looking at a telephone pole because it was so long and skinny. It did not guide until the booster stage burnt out and separated from the upper stage, and the guidance antenna was actually on the bottom of the upper stage and wasn't exposed until it separated. Well, that happened between 10 and 12,000 feet. So you didn't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that if you were below 10,000 feet, it was almost impossible for a SAM site to hit you because it was really designed as a high altitude interceptor and it didn't think it needed to guide until it was you know, halfway to, to its target. So we understood that, we stayed below, uh, below 10,000 feet and arriving at Magia Pass, what we saw looking out the, the canopy was solid clouds on the ground. And the word we used to describe this kind of cloud cover was scud because it was literally molded to the shape of the ground. And I'm looking at my 1 to 250 map and I can literally tell where the center of Magia Pass is just by looking at the shape of the clouds because the shape of the clouds are the same as the shape of the, of the hills. Could you describe Magia Pass for folks that aren't familiar? It was one of the most heavily contested areas because yes. it was a choke point. Yes. Magia had, the road came through this pass in the mountains and had karst limestone mountains on the west side, on the NKP side, that rose at least 1,500 feet above the, the floor of the valley. On the other side of the pass, the hills were lower, but it still forced the truck traffic to go through a fairly narrow point, but that was why it was so heavily defended by the North Vietnamese because they realized that their trucks were more vulnerable going through this three or four mile pass area than they were, you know, other times. So that was Mugia. And if you go ahead and tell us how the mission progressed from well, the Well, the, the, the OV-10 pilot from Nakhon Phanam, who was a, 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 a pave nail, which was an OV-10 with a laser designator pod, so he could drop, he could put in laser guided weapons. He also had Loran navigation, which is an old Navy system that's worldwide, that's a low frequency, but it, it goes, it covers the whole globe. And so an OV 10 could point the laser at a spot on the ground, and it would tell the pilot and the, the weapon systems operator in the back seat the exact location. So I flew around down low, just above the clouds, until the survivor said, you just passed me. And of course, I'm having my wingman help me get back to that same point. Remember, I'm flying over just white clouds, but you're trying to remember where that, and so we kind of did that. And I said to the fact, just lays that spot, you mean, within how far, we don't know, 100 yards, 300 yards. So we, we, know, we know the spot where the survivor is. So we're kind of frustrated because we are sitting there, I'm thinking as the on-scene commander, that since the helicopter can't see the ground, there's no way to pull this rescue off. Well, what we knew was that it was far enough up in the high ground to the west of the pass itself that the probability of there being any enemy troops up on those mountains was very low. There was no reason for them to be there. They weren't part of the trail. They weren't, there wasn't a village, you know, they just, w and at this point, the low jolly pilot, Major Ken Ernst, who was one of the most outstanding jolly pilots I've ever encountered, Ken Ernst says to me on the radio, Sandy One, I think I can descend slowly through the clouds until I get to the treetops. The rotor wash of this giant H-53 will show me the trees in front of me, and I think I can hover on instruments and go along and maybe find him. 
So I said, well, let's try it. So Ken Ernst flies the jolly down there and starts in the direction toward the guy. And this is something that, to me, in looking back at it, I thought, I had this figured out instantly, even though it was one of those things that I don't remember anybody ever talking about or any of us ever worrying about. Okay, you've got a survivor on the ground, you've got a jolly green who can't see anything, he's just flying on instruments in the clouds, hovering along, how do you know how to help him? Well, what we did with three of us, Sandy 1, Sandy 2, and the OV-10, is we got in a circle above it, about 5,000 feet off the ground, with our automatic direction finding thing on. So each time one of them transmitted, the needle went and pointed toward that transmitter. So we'd say to the survivor, you know, give, give us a five second hold down on your, on your survival radio and say, okay. And then we'd do the same thing with the Jolly. Well, with all three of us doing that. So it's like a radio directional fire. Yeah, it was, we, 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 just, but, but think about it. Yeah. We're, we're doing it in our head. I, I'm doing it. I'm, since I'm, I'm supposedly yeah. <laughs> leading this dance, I'm leading this dance and I'm saying, okay, you know, you, you need to turn you know, zero four zero. What, what's your heading now? Well, I'm at zero six zero. We could turn zero four zero, and we're vectoring Ken Ernst, and the survivor still can't hear him. So we know he's not real close to him. We did this for forty five minutes until Ken Ernst needed gas. So he comes. Here comes this jolly up out of these white clouds. Goes back to the. C-130 Kingbird tanker and refuels, and there was never any consideration of having the high jolly go down there because I never would have told the jolly to do this had had the jolly not said to me, "I think I can try this." You know, it was it was just too dangerous. Uh, it wasn't something that anybody had ever done before, uh, and so Ken went out, refueled, came back. We kept doing it. It's it's getting dark, and about this time. Two Navy A7s are up above us, and they have got little Shrike anti-radiation missiles. So they're not like a wild weasel with all the fancy gear. They've just got a radar homing and warning thing, but they can shoot a, strike, a Shrike at a SAM site, and the A7, Navy A7 says to the Sandys and the Jollies, we have got a an active SA-2 uh, pre-launch signal and about this time this SA-2 comes out of the clouds and and basically the three of us are in this circle and it went the missile went right by us in the middle of the circle with the booster still on it in this great big long thing and you see the booster separate and then the missile it, whatever they shot it at I think they were trying to scare us off and we said oh and so I said you know, SA-2, you know, headed, headed northwest, and, and uh, one of the A-7s says on the radio, that wasn't an SA-2, that was our Shrike that we shot at the SAM site. And, and my wingman says, hey, whatever his call sign was, he said, I think we know the difference of a 15-foot-long missile coming out of the clouds going by us and your little shrike coming down out of the sky into the clouds. <laughs> but it was an interesting conversation because we never could figure out how if these guys were the ones that alerted us, why they didn't see the missile oh, yeah. uh, you know, that, that, that went by all of us. So anyway, that was my close encounter with an SA-2 that obviously was not a threat to us because it couldn't even guide. It was just, you know, it was just he, we don't know why, what he shot it at or why they shot it. But anyway, Ken Ernst made three runs and the sun went down. And the thing we realized was that our survivor was very badly injured. It was a lieutenant colonel named Bob Belli, B-E-L-L-I, and he was the, the pilot of the Wild Weasel. And as it turned out, he had a dislocated knee and a compound fracture of his upper left arm. Compound meaning it yeah, was boy, sticking, sticking through the skin. So imagine this guy's in a cold, wet, jungle, he's on the ground, 
He's got water, he's got good radio and good battery, but he's not in good physical shape. So one of the things that I asked for, that we always did, that I was pretty comfortable with, I said to the nail, I said, you guys have got to have somebody out here all night over the top of him, making sure you're talking to him. Because we don't want this guy to pass out when we get back here in the morning and we can't figure out where he is because he's not physically able to talk. So we went back. Um, Sandy pilots don't get any sleep when you know that you're going to have the 4 a.m. first light briefing the next morning. And I went back and for some reason, uh, the wing commander and the squadron commander, I said, look, you can put somebody else out there, but I really ought to do this because I'm the guy that A, knows where he is, and B, knows how to run this crazy vectoring system that we were using, which nobody had ever even thought about that. This was a, this was a first ever use of such a crazy way, because normally you're looking down, you're looking at the helicopter. You say, go that way, because you, know, you can see the ground. We, we get up and brief at four o'clock. Uh, I've now got an even more experienced wingman. I've got Major Zeke Encinas on my wing, which was phenomenal. Uh, and I've also got Dan Gibson, the OV-10 uh, pave nail, back again, which is great. Um, and I've got Ken Ernst back, which is the most important thing that I've got, because he's the guy that's doing all the work in the Jolly. And we immediately, and the weather is identical. It has not gotten worse, it has not gotten better, it looks the very same and Bob Belli's still talking to us in the morning. And we said, we're gonna get you. Well, now it really gets interesting. In the briefing, big briefing room in the, at NKP, Captain Bill Berner, who is the hobo flight surgeon and an amazing doctor, uh, has said, I'm gonna fly on the Jolly. So Bill Berner puts on his combat vest and his gun and you know, gets on the Jolly Green with Ken Ernst and his crew. And so we start down, and this is, the sun just comes up, so it's 6.30 in the morning, and Ken is creeping along, and all of a sudden, he stops and says, we just found Ashcan 01 Bravo. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, parachute is hung up in the very top of the jungle canopy and Bravo is hanging in the parachute, lifeless. And they sat there and hovered and Bill Berner, the doctor, is looking out and he says, he is, he's not alive, he couldn't be alive, he couldn't have hung there for this many hours and be alive. And as it turns out, once we later learn from Bob Belli, he probably died in the high-speed ejection. It probably broke his neck or something. But anyway, so here's, and we all agreed instantly that as much as we would like to send the PJ down and recover Bravo's body, that wasn't the right thing to do. The right thing was to keep going to try to get Alpha. And sure enough, one refueling later and back in, the Ashcan, Bob Bell, I says, I hear the helicopter. And I said, you got your compass? And he said, I do. I said, okay, you vector the helicopter. So Bob Bell, I basically talks the jolly the last hundred yards or however far it was. PJ has to go down because Bell, I can't, I mean, if you've got a dislocated you know, knee, PJ gets him on, hoists him up, and the most amazing thing was for all of us to watch this 80,000 pound helicopter just levitate out of the clouds and turn and, and head back to NKP. Wow. And the good thing was you had Bill Berner, our doctor, on the helicopter. So he's administering to this badly wounded, you know, he's got Novocaine and all these things. And so we had quite a celebration when we got back to NKP. So that's the story of Ash, and I got to meet Bel Bob Belli 15 years later in Washington, um, and he's no longer with us, but I, I got to visit with him and, and he bought me a drink or two. Oh, I imagine he did, <laughs> I imagine he did. Um, it sounds like that was quite the innovation 
It was. It was. It was figure out how to do something on the spot that's never been done before. And the thing that was so neat to me about it was once we figured out Ken Ernst felt safe, I mean, I was scared to death just thinking about him hovering in the weather. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. But once we figured out that he was completely comfortable doing that, and I talked to his crew afterwards, and they said, oh, he was just like iron. He, you know, he was going to do this, and we weren't scared because, you know, it was clear he wasn't. He was, he was you know, in charge, but it was an amazing rescue. And so a bunch of us ended up going to Saigon to brief the generals about how this happened, and they couldn't believe it, and we couldn't believe it either, but it worked. Everybody's happy at the Everybody, end. Everybody's happy at the end. That's fantastic. <laughs> so what other, you, you had several SAR missions that you were involved in, and we had chatted about those briefly mm -hmm. online. So Ashkin Zero One. I had, and I had two other ones that were, that were fascinating that where I tried to the best of my ability to pull off a pickup and failed, and my buddies behind me successfully picked the people up. So it wasn't one of those tragedies where you say, oh, I went out, I tried to get them back, it didn't work, and you know now they're dead or now they're captured in these cases. But they were both, the, the situation to both of them were bizarre. The first one was Falcon 7, 4, Alpha, and Bravo, which was an, a, an F4 out of uh, Udorn. And on that day in March of 20. 17, no, I'm sorry, in December of 71, the Air Force lost five F-4s over North Vietnam. It was one of those days where we thought we were doing a trap to shoot down MiGs, and the MiGs thought they were doing a trap to shoot down F-4s, and the MiGs had it figured out better than the F-4s did. So five airplanes were lost. Um, we recovered, one of the crews went feet wet out into the Gulf of Tonkin and the Navy picked them up. The other one, Falcon 7-4, came and didn't get out of North Vietnam but was near the Laotian border. That's who we went after. The other three, all six crew members got out and all six ended up in the Hanoi Hilton. All six were captured before we could do anything. What happened on Falcon 7-4 was that they were shot down late in the day and we just couldn't get up there to get them but there was a fact there. The fact knew where they were. So what they did at night and we were a part of this and I happened to be the pe person on the schedule the next morning to be Sandy One so I was going to be the on-scene commander. They took this area denial munition, which was a powder, and it had an effect on you kind of like tear gas. It made your eyes burn, it made your nose burn, it made you cough, and you wanted to turn around and go the other way. It was, it was in no way fatal. It never killed anybody with it. But you weren't going to walk through this stuff. And so our idea was when you dropped it, it tended to spread in the direction of the F-4s dropped it. So we basically created a box around the two guys on the side of this mountain. And you know, one way, one way, one way, one way. Well, the best made plans of men. Three of the four F-4 crews dropped, and they're using Loran, the same, the same nav that the, that the paved nail OV-10s have got. Three of the four dropped perfectly on their corner of this square. Perfectly, You could see the powder. The Wizzo in the fourth F-4 got confused between the coordinates of their corner of the box and the coordinates of the survivor. And sure enough, in the dark, where nobody could see, dropped four cans of this <laughs> Bluey 52 right on top of our survivors. So... When we got out there the next morning at six o'clock in the morning as the sun is coming up, the, the nail who'd been there for three hours says, Randy, the guys got in the middle of the Bluey 52, and I've forgotten what the code word was, but we didn't say that on the radio. Yeah. We said he got in the middle of the whatever, the horseradish or what, you know, whatever the word of the day was. And they had to move 
and they couldn't talk for a while, and they seem to be okay now. Said, oh, great. So now you got to start where to find them. Yeah, well but, well, but they hadn't moved that far. So I made a couple of passes. We confirmed where they were, and we said, okay. And Ron Smith was my roommate, and Ron and I talk to this day that we're looking down there. We realize that part of that and I that area of denial stuff is really close to him, but it never occurs to us how much of a problem that is. So Clyde Bennett, who's the low jolly, who I'd flown a number of SARS with, who was superstar jolly pilot, said, Clyde, they're right there. We don't, we're not going to put down any ordinance. They're not saying there's anybody around them. You ought to be able to just, because we're up on a high mountain, you just ought to be able to go in and pick them up, and we'll be right there to cover you. So Clyde comes in. I'm, Ron Smith and I are doing that with the other two Sandys, so we got four airplanes, and just as they get in the hover above the first guy, I had no trouble finding him. He's standing there, you know, waving at him. Just as they get in the hover, the rotor wash kicks the kicks Bluey 52 powder. powder up, and you hear Clyde Bennett coughing and choking, and you see the helicopter. It, it was all that... Clyde and his co-pilot could do to keep flying and so they're almost incapacitated they're almost in incapacitated here. and unbeknownst to us the minute that happened one of the guys in the back of the helicopter and I don't know if it was a, a, para, a PJ a parajumper or if it was the uh, one of the gunners immediately put his mask on so this guy's talking on the radio like a normal human being while the rest of the crew is, you know, is choking and coughing and whatever. So they get out. We call timeout. <laughs> they go back to the tanker. They put on their gas mass equipment, which was very restrictive both to vision and to communication. It sounded like somebody talking to you you know, through a, <laughs> through a soup can or something. Um, and they start back in again. And we're talking to the survivors. You got any noise around you? No. Any indication of bad guys? No. So we start back in. Clyde is in the hover over the guy again. And some North Vietnamese with an AK-47 has the classic golden BB, puts an AK, a 30 caliber rifle bullet through the main fuel line of one of the two engines on the Jolly. And what Ron Smith and I, and I, not Ron Smith, what, uh, yeah, Ron Smith was my wingman. What we observed was an amazing piece of airmanship by Clyde Bennett because he's high up on a mountain where it's hard to hover with the weight of the helicopter with two engines. Now he's only got one engine. Well, he basically starts this dive down the side of the mountain. And from our perspective, it looked like he was just going to crash into the side of the mountain. But he's just barely clearing the treetops, and he goes down over 1,000 feet into the valley and, and recovers. And so we stayed there. The other two Sandys took Clyde to one of the very remote Laotian uh, hard sites up on top of a hill and basically crash landed the Jolly with one engine. And then we had to set, now we had to work with the ambassador and set up a perimeter. And the other Jolly went over, picked up the crew, took them out. So they leave this very expensive piece of equipment sitting up there. Um, and we're out of gas. So we go home. So. Randy, as the on-scene commander, has now made two pickup attempts, both of which failed for reasons that never, ever occurred to me before they happened. It, you, I obviously knew it was happening when it happened. And so we go back and land, and, and my good friend Lloyd Welkin, who I went to pilot training with, comes out with the next set of Sandys, goes in, puts down a little ordinance around the guys, runs the helicopter in, picks the two guys up, and comes home. So all's, all's well that ends well, but it sort of didn't end well for, for this on-scene commander. But, and the other punchline was they flew 
an H-53 up to this hard site with the maintenance guys <laughs> to work on Clyde's Jolly, and they took an engine with them. And here's what they did. They put a new fuel line on the engine that got shot out, ran it up and checked it. They removed the other engine that Clyde had flown out on because in the H-53, you had the capability to go to a power setting well above normal. So he basically overtemped and burnt up that jet engine, mm -hmm. saving the helicopter, and all they had to do was change that engine and threw it away and flew the helicopter back home. So as I said, all's well that ends well. Wow. You know, I've heard of guys overboosting an engine, uh, and uh, we were, I was uh, filming Operation <laughs> Tailwind. Yes. And yep. uh, the third H-53, was saying how as he was, you know, hovering, getting everybody out, he wound up putting 50 people on his aircraft. Oh, he so said, good. I'm the last, I know nobody else is coming in. Mm -hmm. He said, so as I'm taking off, he said, I lose an engine. He said, I'm doing everything I can to keep that thing in the air because we went from a hover, you know, he said, we were still hovering when I lost the engine. He said, so I'm just, he said, I'm just pounding it to get out of yeah, there. The other said, engine. So I overboost that second engine. Yeah. He said, we're plowing through the trees on the way out. They said, I'm on my way at home at 3,000 feet thinking, man, I'm fat, dumb, and happy. It's going to be a good day. And he said, then the second engine went. Oh, no. And he's like, oh, my God. <laughs> so he auto-rotates. He did, and he wound up going down into a valley. He's like, I, I call Mayday. Yeah. And he said, I'm hoping somebody says, hey, there's a clearing here. He said, nobody says anything. <laughs> Said, well, I, those guys were down there in the middle of nowhere for that. Oh, yes, they were. Yeah. So, and you know, the, the fourth Jolly or the fourth H fifty three comes in behind and, and picks, picks them all what's up. What's left of everybody? Yeah. Nobody got killed in the crash. So there was a lot of, you know, yeah. bumps and. But bruises. they so they lost the H fifty three. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, "Now know, was that a Jolly or was that one of the knives from NKP that flew with us, the special ops?" The, all I heard they kept saying it was a dimmer, so it was a it marine. Was, Oh, it was Marine. Okay. Yeah, this so it was like, okay. Uh, it was like yeah. combined yeah. because they, they were just grabbing aircraft at the end because the, the, the team was going to get overrun. They were like, right. oh, we need guys to get yeah. out. Yeah. So, yeah. But yeah I, no, I believe it was a mm. dimmer. Okay. Uh, it, was, it was Marine. Yeah. But uh, yeah, when, when, uh, when an engine gets cooked. Yeah, but the, some of them last a long time, depending on how much you overboosted it. And in Clyde's that. case, he flew 75 miles and landed, oh, and yeah. it was fine. It'd be, now they replaced it. So, but do you want to run on that anymore? No. Nope. <laughs> but they said it was interesting because the one that that the the magic bullet Never hit the, the fuel engine. line, they put the new fuel line on that engine, just cranked right up, and it was fine because wow. it it quit when it was in good shape. So let's go to your third mission. We were discussing. Uh, in your well, the third mission is one that I think I think you've talked, Rich, to other people about was the famous Nail 3-1 Alpha and Bravo, and that was uh, a, an OV-10 Nail FAC, so front seater and back seater, from NKP that got shot down in central Laos uh, in a river spot that we call the Catcher's Mitt, and if you see, the, see it on a map, it looks exactly like, uh, like a Catcher's Mitt with a thumb, and then uh, and these guys get shot down, and so I'm having a nice relaxed day off, working with the wing commander in his office. And he says, oh, we got a OV-10 down, and so I go with him to the command post. Well, the first Sandys and Jollies go out, and Mike Foss, who's the lead Sandy, is making a low pass trying to figure out where the survivors are, and the gun shoots him down. And Mike was able to glide going back west. This is only... 60 miles from NKP. It's, it's in Laos, but it's not far from home. Mike manages to glide a few miles and then uses the Yankee system and extracts. And an Air America Huey picks him up before the Jolly. The Jolly's there. The Jolly can't get there as fast. As, so Mike's on his way home with our friends from Air America. And the next set of Jollies, the next set of Sandys, Don Milner is the lead. And he takes a round from this 37 millimeter gun that puts over a hundred holes in the back of his airplane. And, and I've got a great picture taken on the ground of it. He, he flew it back and landed. But by this time we've got 
the third Sandys out there, and this gun has now shot down two airplanes and severely damaged the third one. And the squadron commander says, as we're in the command post, we need a smoke flight, which was a flight loaded wall to wall with uh, white phosphorus bombs and CBU canisters. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking around and I said, I volunteer, I'll lead the smoke flight. And my squadron commander, uh, Marty Barbina, says, you'll need a wingman. And I turned and looked at the wing commander, Jack Robinson, who had two or three MiG kills in Korea, who had an A-1 tour as a major, was now the wing commander on his second A-1 tour. And I said, sir, and he said, absolutely. And so I've now got the best wingman in the world. <laughs> I've, got, I've got my wing commander. And so we hustle out, they get the airplanes loaded, we, we get in the airplane, and the first thing that happens is we take off, and as remember, we're not going very far. I get up and level off, and I reach up to pull the prop speed lever back, and it just flops in my hand. It's not connected to anything. And so the prop is at full takeoff RPM, 3,600 RPM, which is fine. The airplane, that's the, way you, that's the way you take off and land. But I obviously can't go and burn gas like that. I mean, I would run out of gas like this. So I say, hey, I've got to turn around and go back. Well, now I've got to land a fully loaded A1 with fuel and all this ordnance and not get hot brakes and not close the runway by taking the barrier. So I, I rolled <laughs> all 8,000 feet before I got slowed down, taxied in, shut the engine off. Meanwhile, Colonel Robinson's on his way to the SAR. I said, you, boss, you just go on down, I'll meet you. Um, crew chief opens up the panel on the side, looks, reaches down in his box and pulls out about a two inch long cotter pin, which I was very familiar with from my auto mechanic days, and holds it up to me and, and goes like this, and I go, yeah. So he, it's, it's, link, it's linkage, and he puts the cotter pin in the linkage, and he looks at me and he says, you know, check, and I go like this, and he closes it down. Meanwhile, smartly, the crew chief has pulled a fuel truck up and topped me back off because I used some gas taking off and coming back around. So I go off, take off again. So I'm 15 minutes behind Colonel Robinson. We get down there, and what I realize very quickly is that we know where the gun is relative to these two guys. These two survivors on the ground are great because these guys are facts. And they're listening to this gun shoot, and they, you know, they basically know the exact heading from where they are to where the gun is, and it was just a matter of figuring out where it was. Well, it occurred to me that if you brought the helicopter in from the 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 gun was about a mile or a mile and a quarter north of the survivors, and we knew pretty much where it was. But we didn't want to go have a fight with a gun. But it occurred to me, if you're flying a Jolly Green and you're coming in along the treetops, and this wasn't heavy jungle canopy, this was lighter, for, I would call it forest kind of, you know, lower trees. If he just flew along and drug his landing gear along the top of the trees, he could pull right up, pick the two survivors up, turn around and go out, and the gun would never see him. The gun couldn't, you know, his his. Angle of, deflection. angle of deflection, he couldn't see the guy, let alone shoot at him. So we brief, and I know I've got a good young captain, low jolly pilot out there that I'm very comfortable with. So I give the briefing and I said, now you know, understand, I don't want you ever to get more than 20 feet above the top of the trees and you're gonna be safe. So Colonel Robinson and I dropped the one and only full smoke corridor that I'd ever seen. I mean, we'd brief this and practice it, but he and I are now, we're the smoke, so we're dropping the smoke. It was perfect. It was like we went out and, and, set, up and, and set up a wall. And so here's this corridor and the gun's on down that way. And the sun is almost to set, it's almost dark. So we gotta get this going. So 
might. Oh, and well, what I didn't say was when the last Sandys that were there when, when Colonel Robinson and I first got there, when the Sandy on scene commander, when they ran out of gas, whoever that was, and I don't even remember now, realized that I was the on scene Sandy qualified flight lead who had been sitting there watching the whole thing for two hours, where the other Sandys that had just gotten there had come from Da Nang and Ubon, and they didn't have any idea what was going on. And he said, okay, ran, Smoke was my call sign. Yeah. He said, Smoke 4-4 is now the on-scene commander. So it was unusual that somebody with a call sign other than Sandy was now the on-scene commander, but to the... To the hobo squadron guys, it was no, you know, that's Randy. Yep. You know, Randy's a Sandy lead. This is what we ought to do. So we brief this, and we're four A ones in our daisy chain, mm -hmm. trying to get this guy to shoot and making sure that, and and we were flying so that we flew behind him when we went to where he was. So if he's going to shoot at us, he had to turn around and point completely away, you know, From I mean, so, yeah. and we would, fire. you know, we were, we were trying to, we were trying to tempt him. Guy never flew, I'm sure they were listening on the radio, never fired a shot at this point. We look up and as the sun is setting and it's, it's dusk, here's this Jolly Green, 600 feet up in the air. And I start screaming at the jolly, get down, get down, and he doesn't. And I said, abort, abort, break, you know, 180, go. He doesn't do anything. And at this point, the gun shoots at him. And I'm in a position west of the north gun, the south survivors, and I'm at a position where it looked to me like in the dark with this clip of 37 millimeter, which has got tracers. Yeah. It looked to me like the tracers went through the rotor path of the helicopter. That's how close they, but he missed him. And of course, the minute the guy shot, this helicopter turns. And I am just flabbergasted. What on earth happened? What happened to the briefing, the drag gear, landing gear along the tree? And of course, Colonel Robinson, who's, you know, my wingman, is watching this whole thing. And as we call it off, tell the survivors, because now it's dark, tell the survivors we'll come back and get them in the morning. Um, Colonel Robinson says to me on the FM radio, Randy, don't talk to the Jollies until I do. And I could tell by the tone of his voice <laughs> that he was furious. I mean, he's not mad at me. He's, he's just furious about what just happened. So here's the punchline. We get back to NKP. We both go over to the Jollies, or they come to the command post. And the young captain tells us what happened. There was a lieutenant colonel who had been the commander of the Jolly Squadron at NKP who had been fired as the commander. And he had been sent to Saigon to the rescue headquarters where he was sitting behind a desk and he'd been doing that for four or five months. And I knew the guy because he was there when I first got to NKP. He had come up to NKP to fly his one mission a month so that he got his combat pay. He had bumped the other captain who was the high jolly without any of us knowing it. So when Mike Foss went down to start the SAR, he thought he had the two captains that he had briefed with that morning as the two jollies, and instead he had the captain as the low jolly and this lieutenant colonel from Saigon as the high jolly. What this guy did is he ordered the captain to change places with him to do the pickup. Oh, no. And the captain didn't say anything to us on the radio, which I later, without yelling at the guy, said, look, from an integrity standpoint, you really should have, you should have called me and said, I'm no longer the low jolly, and then I would have taken care, you know, of the rest of that. But anyway, Colonel Robinson was so livid that that guy was on the 
C-130 back to Saigon within an hour and, and to my understanding never flew another combat mission. But the next morning when the Sandys went back, John Lackey was the on-scene commander and they'd move more guns in. Okay. So John and the, and I wasn't, didn't fly that day, but John and the other three Sandys took like three hours to make it safe enough. And then John ran the Jolly Inn exactly, exactly the way we, we had briefed it uh, and picked the two guys up and we it came back to NKP. But it was, it was one of those things where, you know, in my mind, what could I have done different? Nothing, absolutely nothing. What do I wish had happened? I wish the captain Jolly had said, you know, smoke 4-4, four, four. I'm not the low Jolly anymore. It's not like you had time to see what they were doing. No, and no, they're, they're, they're out there out of sight. And, and see, that conversation they had took place on a frequency where my two other Sandys, who were, they couldn't hear it either, so they didn't know what happened. They just all of a sudden see the guy, you know, start the run in the way we briefed it. But it was one of those things that would have been an absolute tragedy if those guys had gotten captured or killed that night mm -hmm. instead of being picked up because we, we had them picked up. Or if that jolly had taken hits and caused oh, yeah, greater issues. Oh, yeah. Then you've got how many more, how many, how many yeah, more rocks? Yeah, five, five, yeah. So you would have had seven on the ground. If you were lucky. Exactly. You know, exactly. That could have been absolutely So, crazy. Nail 3 1 Alpha and Bravo was uh, not my favorite mission, but it had a good ending. Well, I can see where that is, but you know, it's all the contributing factors, and thank goodness you guys have come up with a great plan yeah. and adhered to that. Yeah. But the thought of more guns coming into the area, the Vietnamese loved baited traps. Oh, absolutely. And, and people would say, you Sandys are so brave because you go down there and troll at 300 feet. And, and I would say, we're not as brave as you think because most of the time those guys were too smart to shoot at us. Mm -hmm. Because if they shot at us, we knew where we were. We'd come back and shoot at them. And they, you know, they wanted to shoot at the helicopter. They, did, they weren't after A1s. They were after Jolly Greens. Since you've gone in that direction, let's talk about the integrity and the courage that it took and, and I imagine um, that every time you got in that plane, you either had an absolutely positive thought of nothing's going to touch me, or maybe you had a question, but the Jollies, I mean, that's a very thin-skinned aircraft, and they seem to be, uh, their motto is, so others may live. Can you, t and I know you've spoken with those guys, can you speak to any of that, of what the mental state had to be going in what would a man do to save another man? I mean, how did you get at that? It's, it's fascinating, Rich, because one of the things that I figured out in the first couple of months I was there, and we flew not only with the Jollies, but with the 21st SOS Knives who flew the Army uh, Special Ops Team's secret missions with us, and they were just like the Jollies. I mean, they were every bit as good and every bit as brave flying in the same kind of situations, except they were trying to pick up whole teams, not, you know, not just one or two people. <clears throat> but the thing I figured out was those guys had a, a very clear perception that they were in danger, they were in a lot of danger, but they were going to do their job right, and these two guys flying around above them in A1s were going to take care of them. Now that, once you figure that out as an A1 guy, that's a pretty big burden. If you think this guy and five crew members and this 80,000 pound helicopter really think you can protect them from anything, you know, that's that's a wonderful thought, but it's not realistic. But that was the way it was. And so it's, it's so interesting. Years later, every A1 pilot will tell you that the bravest people they saw were the helicopter pilots, were the Jollies, the Knives, the, the Army Huey guys, the, the Air America Huey and H-34 guys that we flew with in Laos. The five hobos that were shot down in Laos during my tour all five, including Mike Foss, who I described in Nail 3 one 
All five of them were picked up by Air America before the U.S. guys ever got there. That's how good the Air America guys were. Um, so I think that was a special mindset and a special commitment to bravery that these helicopter guys had. And the ones that had it the best were the ones that always ended up making the pickups. It was the Dale Stovalls and the Clyde Bennetts and the Ken Ernst that did Ash Can. I mean, everybody looked at that and thought, that's impossible. How did, how did he do that? You know? Um, so they were an amazing breed. And the, the guys in the back of those helicopters were, I believe, those PJs go down that penetrator into no man's land. And a couple of times the PJ got left on the ground because the, the, the helicopter got shot off or, the, or the, the cable broke or something like I mean, they were the bravest of the brave. And to, and to go down and get a guy like Bob Belli, who's almost dead, and get him on the penetrator with, you know, a leg that doesn't work and an arm that, you know, he screams every time it moves, uh, and get him up. They, those, those PJs were amazing and are still to this day are amazing. Unbelievable. Um, we had chatted just a little bit on the phone and we were talking about Prairie Fire missions and you had supported a few of those. I got lucky early on and interviewed a few of the Green Berets. And when we're talking about courage, uh, I, I know that there was a, an instance I was there when Green Berets were talking to Sky Raider pilots, and they each said, you're the craziest guy in the world. Because the Sky Raider pilot thought the guy on the ground was nuts. And the guy on the ground's like, I'm on the ground, I'm okay. You're up there and everybody's shooting at you. Can you talk about a Prairie Fire mission a little bit? Something yes, that... now, and the interesting thing about Prairie Fire is, and I didn't know this at the time, flying, but... The, these were, uh, the, the name of the unit was MACV SOG, Military Assistance Command Special Operations Group. And they were in Saigon, and they had teams in South Vietnam and teams in Thailand at Nakhon Phanom that they would put in to North Vietnam, to the Laotian Trail, the Ho Chi Minh Trail, to the Chinese border to watch trains coming. And, you know, so we put them in places that you would have thought would have been very bad places to be on the ground. What we didn't know at the time, but what's now very well documented in the, in the writings, is they had one or more moles in the Saigon operation such that most of their missions <coughs> after about 1967 were compromised. So the bad guys knew where the team was going, on what day, at what time, to what landing zone. And so that's why in my time we experienced so many situations where in the knife helicopters would put them in, where we put the team in and turn around and before we got back to NKP, they're surrounded and calling an emergency and we've got to go back and get them. So it was a it was a very nasty situation. And I had one prairie fire mission. Well first, we were very close to the to the Army guys that lived in the Confinam. Ed Lazane was the commander, Mike Taylor was the ops officer, and then Ed transferred and Mike became the, the, the commander of this little group. They would fly with the facts while the team was on the ground. One of them would be in the back seat and they, so they could keep radio communication with their covert team. I believe they called them a Covey rider. They called them a Covey rider because the Covey facts were in yep. on the Vietnam side, but the, the nails where we were, they yep. would ride with them. And every once in a while, they'd get in with us in the two-seater. And I had a wonderful story where Mike Taylor said, Randy, can my first sergeant fly with you today on the prairie fire mission if you've got a two-seater. And I said, yeah, I happen to have. And you really wanted somebody in the right seat because, as you know, it's hard to see out the right side if you were flying it and there was nobody in that seat. You made a lot of left turns, didn't you? So this wonderful uh, Samoan-American first sergeant, who we call Pineapple, uh, who was the guy that cooked, that cooked the roast pig in the pit. Oh, it was unbelievable. I never, I've never had anything like that. Anyway. He briefs with the team, goes and gets briefed on the, the Yankee egress system by my, I wasn't doing the brief, and then met me at the airplane, and he's got a survival vest on like I do. He's got his carbine 
strapped to his right leg. And on his survival vest, he has got six hand grenades. And I said, Sarge, we can't do that. You can't strap into that ejection seat next to me this far away with six hand grenades. Because if a round comes in the cockpit, you know, and blows up the hand grenade, you know, we're all dead. You need to leave them here. And he looks at me and he said, these things are very dangerous. I can't just leave them here. And my crew chief standing on the wing with his, with his face right here listening to this. We don't have our helmets on yet. Listen to this discussion. And I turned around and I said, I trust my life to this guy every single day. And he takes care of me. And he takes care of airplanes that have got a lot bigger boom booms than your hand grenade. Give him your hand grenades and he'll give them to you on the way back. And so he reluctantly hands the crew chief six hand grenades and the guy is stuffing them in his pockets and he goes down and he goes over to his toolbox on wheels with a lock and he opens the door and he puts the grenades in and he turns the lock and he goes like this. I go like this. So we go fly the mission, of course, and come so back. Pineapple is not, he, he, in his mind, if we go down. Yeah, I'm going to take care I, of it. Yeah, I've yeah. got teeth. I'm, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, I've exactly. got a little bit of defense. Exactly. Yeah. But anyway, the, the, on another one of these Prairie Fire missions, which was the first one that I led, and for some reason, th there were only about six pilots at a time in the in the hobos that were Prairie Fire qualified. And you, it was those of us who at the time had a top secret clearance. That was, that was what you had to, and a lot of guys didn't have one. So anyway, I end up as my wingman, Dale Potton, who was senior to me and who was the guy that checked me out in Prairie Fire. So I'd flown three or four Prairie Fires as his wing, so I'm the lead. We, we put the team in, we start home, we get called back in emergency. <laughs> and the team is in a clearing that's got fairly high elephant grass. And as we run the knife in, to pick the team up, these North Vietnamese start coming out of the, the surrounding forest across this elephant grass shooting at the helicopter. So Dale Potton and I are strafing, you know, these the bad guys, guys with 20 millimeter cannons, which is very, and, and pretty soon these guys stop running at the helicopter. I think they realized that <laughs> there was more rain, and the other thing is, the guy shooting a, a minigun out of the helicopter at him. So it's not it's not just us. They're you know they're they're a little outgunned. Yeah. So the helicopter comes off, and he's got bullet holes. And Mike Taylor, the commander, is in the nail fac. Is the Covey rider in the back seat of the of the nail that was running the mid? And see, they're the on scene commander, not us in that situation. They have special knowledge. Yeah, exactly. Because they've been on the yeah. ground and they're quarterbacking this yeah. whole thing. Yeah, so, so Mike Taylor and, and Dan Gibson, the fact, say to me on the radio, whatever my call sign, Hobo 4-4, four four, you're, you're cleared in, you saw where the bad guys are, the helicopter's gone, you're, you know, you're cleared. And I said, we'll just sprinkle CBU you know, all over that. And so I told Dale, I said, I'll go in first, you watch and if you see somebody shoot at me, then you're, you know, you do that. And he said, gotcha. So I roll in and I'm just within two seconds of hitting the button to drop a whole bunch of CBU. And I get these flashes at me right from where the helicopter was. And just as I'm ready to push the button, Mike Taylor screams at me on the radio and says, go through dry, come off dry, come off dry. So I came off and told Dale to not, I said, what's going on? And he said, <clears throat> I just talked to the team on the helicopter and <clears throat> this was an all indigenous team. So the team leader, radio guy, everybody were Montagnard tribesmen. Mm -hmm. They had a guy who took an AK round through his femur and they had carried him to the LZ, but because of the fire, they didn't load the guy on the helicopter. Oh. 
and they left him. And Mike said, we're going to go back and get him. And I said, and I can tell you exactly where he is because that wasn't a gun. That was a signal mirror, <laughs> which is very distinct. You know, it doesn't look, you know, if, if you just wiggle it like that, in a pattern that's different than a muzzle flash would be. And I said, I said, where is he? I said, right to the right of where the helicopter was. And so that knife crew with a shot up team in the back, wounded, goes back in, goes into a hover, and Dale and I did World War III again, and they had to get out of the helicopter and of course pick the guy up and put him on and go out. So the last part of the story was was the scariest part that I intentionally never explained to my friends next door in the knives. I came into the squadron two or three days later and the hobo squadron first sergeant says, Captain Jane, I need to show you something. And I said, okay. And he said, I'm gonna show you your gun camera film from three days ago. And I said, okay. And I realized it was this prairie fire mission. So I'm looking at the gun camera of me shooting. And here's the helicopter. And here are these guys coming out of the woods. And I am shooting, shooting, shooting. And they're coming toward the helicopter. And I'm shooting, shooting, shooting. And I finally pull off when I'm really close. My 20 millimeter tracers went through the rotor pattern of the helicopter. Because I'm looking at these bad guys and I, my eyeballs are focusing and I'm shooting them and I never realized I got that close to it. And I thought, I don't think I'll show that to the knives. <laughs> but it proves the big sky theory that even though there were seven big rotor blades going around, my bullets managed to find the air in How between. How miraculous is that? Because I mean, it's a blur. If you've been around a helicopter, oh, yeah. it's just. Oh yeah. yeah, and there's seven. How many yeah. blades are there on that? Seven, thing? I seven. think. Yeah. Oh my gosh! But yeah. the interesting thing is, you see these twenty millimeter. You know, they explode. It's a yeah. cannon. It's not just a bullet. You see these things coming up closer, and I thought, well, that's about as close as I ought to get. Um, and then it kept coming in. A but when we walked over and looked at the knife when he got back, he had like thirty AK-47 holes. He didn't have anything bigger than that, but yeah. he had a lot of small arms fire. When you go into those missions, from what I understood, it was incredibly hot on the Oh, yeah, because these guys were, they were compromised and they knew where they were. Now, on the other hand, over the course of the war, they cut communications lines on the trail, uh, you know, phone lines that the North Vietnamese used to communicate. They cut water pipelines that they had to supply fresh water to their troops on the trail. They cut, they had a pipeline that had gasoline for their trucks. They, you know, blew those up. And on occasion, they captured a North Vietnamese soldier. So they got intel, you know. Prisoner snatch was always a highly rewarded. Yes, but uh, very hard to do. Oh, and very dangerous. Yeah. Have you read Lynn Black's book? Uh, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot? No. He was Green Beret, mm -hmm. and some munitions officer says, you know there's a fine line between when, when you're using um, a claymore, you know, or, or plastic explosive, between killing people and knocking them out. So Lynn says, well, what's the fine line? And the guy goes, I really don't know. <laughs> so Lynn goes out, and he literally... He'd feel the concussion from an explosion with C4. He'd go a few more steps. So he's testing on himself. I don't think I'd do that. <laughs> you know, he shows up at the infirmary and he's like, I, I, you know, I've got this horrible headache. He came too. He'd been missing for two days. He had literally passed knocked, out. Yeah, knocked he had knocked himself out for two days. <laughs> and uh, I, I, when I read the book, I was like, he willingly walked into that wall of, you know, this is yeah. the compression of the explosion, trying to find the exact point because he was so intent on prisoner snatch, he knew if he could set it up, he's like, I could stun one versus killing them. And Interesting. I, I, it's kind of like you. War brings out a certain creativity where this has never been done. Yep. And, and let's try this because it, it demands the situation. 
that takes a certain amount of crazy to walk into plastic explosion. Well, I'm on the Facebook site with those guys, with the Back to Be Sog guys, and the sad part of it is the site managers post memorial posts on the days that they lost somebody, and there's you know, there's one there every week yes. uh, of people they lost. And the other thing that's interesting is how many times they really know they lost somebody but couldn't bring their body home. So somebody is technically MIA even though yeah. they explain to the family, no, he's gone. But, you know, that, that's there's a lot of people in that sad category. We have, uh, there's three people here mm -hmm. uh, that uh, they have right. relatives that are MIA. Yeah, I met the, met the daughter last night. Yeah. Yes, and uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong, you had a choice. If they saw you go down, could you say, carry me MIA for my family's sake? And, and there was financial, you know, they would... I don't, I don't think it's correct. Rich to say that you had a choice. I think what happened was early in the war people got listed as MIA even though their buddies knew they were gone. I mean the airplane went into the ground and blew up and nobody got out of it. Yeah. So, so, uh, and so later on what you had was uh, survivors, people in the unit talking to the families and saying, look, you shouldn't have your hopes up. We don't want to, you know, on the one hand, we don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but on the other hand, you're, you're better off understanding that you shouldn't, you know, assume that there's still some hope because from our perspective, there is absolutely not. And so people got status changed from MIA to KIA based on those those kind of interactions, and okay. we did a couple of them. Uh, Carol Lilly was one of the guys that went down right at the start of my tour, that they finally changed from MIA to KIA because the guys, I wasn't involved with flying it, but the, the guys in the squadron that were, they just said, hey, no, he, you know, Carol died, he's gone. Um, so that, that did happen. Let's talk about, um, as we were at breakfast this morning, you were talking about an incident that happened in training, I believe, oh. where you had to eject at a very low altitude and everybody was surprised you had survived. Can you lead me through that just yeah. because it kind of fits in with, you know, when you go into the military, anything can happen anywhere. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. anywhere in life. But, yeah, you know. and particularly when you're a pilot, things yeah. happen and they happen fast. So the A-1 propeller was... 13 and a half feet in diameter. And if you ever had a little toy gyroscope when you were a kid and you pulled the string out and spun it up, you could push the, on the side of that gyroscope while it was spinning and push it over and take your finger up and it'd come right back up. That gyroscopic effect from the torque of the engine in the A1 was so strong that it wanted to rotate the airplane around the propeller to the left, which was the direction the propeller was spinning. So when you took off, or any time you went from low power to high power quickly, the airplane wanted to go to the left. So on takeoff, it was full right rudder and some right aileron to keep you going straight down the runway because of the torque. Well, one of the things we did in training, and you're always going to be a better pilot if when you do something in training, you you register it and remember it. We would go up to 5,000 feet off the ground, put the landing gear down, put the flaps down, slow the airplane down to a landing speed like below 120 knots. So you're just kind of floating along and you would take the throttle and just pop it forward. The airplane would start to torque roll. If you'd go full right rudder, full right aileron, and you would always stop the airplane right here. You couldn't stop it here, you definitely couldn't stop it here, and you could never stop it when it first started to roll. So you learned this is what the, the end of a torque roll looks like. So night bombing mission, I've, there are 70 missions in the 
training syllabus. I've only got this is I've got this is my fifth one to go. I'm finished after this one and four more. Night bombing on the Eglin ranges. Uh, flight of four. IP single seat airplane leading. Solo South Vietnamese student number two. Solo Randy Jane American student number three. And number four is a Vietnamese student who's really having trouble in a two-seater with an, an Air Force instructor pilot in his right seat. So the flight lead briefs me, be particularly careful on takeoff <clears throat> that you watch number two in front of you and be sure that he's doing a correct rejoin on me. We don't want to have him run into me in the dark. And I said, fine. So light airplane, you know, not big bombs, little, little bitty 25 pound practice bombs. And I do a normal takeoff roll, come off the ground, reach down. And just as I reach to raise the gear handle, so I'm 75 feet in the air, climbing positively, and I'm watching the lights, this is dark, the lights of the guy in front of me, and just as I reach for the gear handle, the sound of the engine changes significantly, and I haven't touched anything, and the airplane starts to torque roll. And I mean, it started pretty quickly, and I went full right rudder, full right stick, and pulled the ejection handle in just the length of time I just said that to you. And your altitude was what off the ground? 75 feet. And you were using the Yankee extraction. Yeah, and so I'm it's now... It's not an ejection, it's no, it, it pull, it's a rocket pulls you out. I'm at 75 feet off the ground at 55 degrees of bank. So I go out like this. The way the Yankee works is the rocket pulls you by your shoulders the chute is blown out of the pack underneath you with a little powder charge, like a firecracker, and opens because it's blown open. So you immediately, and then, then the rocket disconnects from you and you reverse direction and you float down. Well, except when you're at 75 feet, there's no room to float down. So torque roll, full right rudder, full right aileron, boom, ejection. I feel myself go out. I reach for the parachute risers, and as I do, I hit the ground. And I hit on my feet. You know, you, your feet won't hold you up very much when you're going 150 miles an hour. So I hit my butt, and that broke my back, compression fracture. And then I bounced, because I'm going laterally across the ground. And I hit on an asphalt cross taxiway, bounced, went 35 feet through the air, did a perfect judo roll, and hit the ground again flat. And I'm lying there, and my body's in shock because I hit the ground so hard. But I'm completely conscious. And <clears throat> the first thing I realized is one of my two Coke fittings where you hook the parachute had physically broken. And as far as I know, it was the only time in an ejection that a Coke fitting ever failed, anybody. And, and they were in F-4s and, you know, a million different airplanes. Anyway, and I'm lying on the ground, and I raised my two legs up. I said, okay, those, those, but I really hurt. But I, I said, my feet are working, my arms are working, and I feel wet. And I put my hand up like this, and we didn't wear oxygen masks at Hurlburt. We wore them in Vietnam, but we just had the little boom mic, so my face is open. But I realize I go like this, and it's blood. And I'm soaking wet with blood all over my chest, and I'm thinking, I don't think I'm bleeding to death. I don't feel anything like that, but that's blood. So meanwhile, the fire truck runs over the parachute. He comes so close to me. So he missed he me. He didn't see you. He didn't see me. And he saw the parachute, and he slams on his brakes and skids across the parachute. So he's the length of the parachute risers 
away from me. So you survived the crash <laughs> so, and, and an extraction. Yeah. And so a young airman who was on the ramp had seen me and came running over. And I said, hey, come help me. And the guy looked at me and turned around and went the other way. Well, I thought it was because he was scared. He actually did the right thing. He thought, I know where he is. I need to tell the fire department. And now the fire department was going to the crashed airplane, so they weren't paying any attention to me. But he then tells somebody where the ambulance is to come get me. So they put me in one of the old field ambulances, cracker box ambulances, looks like MASH, <clears throat> put me on a litter and strap me down. And I say to the corpsman, am I bleeding to death? And he says, no, sir. He says, your, your chin's ripped open. You can still see the scar. Your chin's ripped open. And I said, well, that's from my chin strap when I hit the ground going like that. And he said, no, you're fine. It's just, you know, your facial bleeding is, is like a boxer. You know, you can be covered with blood and you're really not hurt. And that's all that was. But I'm, you know, I'm really having trouble moving. So we're start for Eglin. So it's like 12 miles from Hurlburt around through Fall Rolling Beach to Eglin. It's Christmas season. He's going up the highway. There's a big shopping center. The light is red. He's got his sirens and his lights on. And this lady with the family full of station wagon goes through the green light and doesn't see the ambulance and he hits her broadside. So I'm lying there strapped in the ambulance with the corpsman leaning over me. And the next thing I know is his crash and the corpsman disappears because he's not, I'm, I'm strapped down. He flies into the kind of like the uh, chain link fence between the, the, the cab of the ambulance in the back and hits that pretty hard and he, he got banged up but nothing, nothing serious. And so they're all back checking on me and it didn't hurt anybody in the car, which was amazing. It was one of those 70s, you know, the size of a Monster. small destroyer station wagon full of kids, but it, it fortunately didn't hit or hurt any of them. And so now the civilian ambulance comes and takes me and the corpsman to, to the hospital. And when I get to the hospital, I realize that we've been beaten by another ambulance from downtown that had an airman that got called back in the emergency because my airplane landed on another one and blew it up and there's all sorts of fire and all. And he'd had an, a, a motorcycle accident and he was hurt pretty bad. So he's in the emergency room and I'm in the emergency room. Now during all this, when your airplane hit the other plane, didn't you mention some rockets going off? Well, that Ron Smith said that, but he didn't remember the story. What, okay. what actually happened was the plane hit and the engine, and if you think about the physics of weight, that engine's the heaviest thing on that airplane, oh, yeah. and it's bolted on the front. When that airplane hit the ground, that engine came off. Well, it's a radial engine, so it's round, so it's like a giant wheel from a... <laughs> Just, yeah, and it goes rolling. The engine goes rolling across the ramp, across the grass, into the parking lot, and up the back of my best friend's uh, Plymouth Barracuda, and totals it. Well, it didn't total it, but damaged it Full pretty hurt bad. On it. And the other thing that happened was the A thirty seven. They used to sit alert for the drug runners, mm -hmm. you know, in the in the Gulf of Mexico. It had machine guns on it. I had live 20 millimeter cannon rounds. Now, fortunately, they were training rounds, so the, it was just a bullet. It wasn't an explosive cannon round. These things are cooking off, and so these rounds, you know, are, rounds are going up off the two airplanes, and the fire guys, and of course, they're trained to, you know, to deal with that. But that was all going on unbeknownst to me because I was. Uh, you know, I was on the way to the hospital, but, but the story gets better. Um, I'm in the hospital and Nancy comes to see me. They say, you've got a broken back, but it's a clean compression fracture and it's going to be sore for a while, but we don't think you did any spinal damage other than you're now <laughs> shorter than you used to be. Um, but I had these terrible bone bruises all along my right side. And I could tell that was going to take forever. Well, I'm confronted with two orthopedic specialists at the Eglin Hospital, one major and one young captain. 
And looking at this major, it took me about 10 seconds to conclude, I don't like this guy. I'm not going to like this guy at all, and he's not going to take good care of me. So that's what Randy's brain is saying. <clears throat> and this guy says, we, in, we need to put you in a body cast immediately. And the other doctors over there, young guys, you know, kind of rolling his eyes. And I said, I don't need a body cast. You just need to put me in a brace. To, and he says, no, you need a body cast. So they put me in a body cast. Then they start giving me morphine. Well, that's when I learned how people become drug addicts. Because that stuff, I mean, I was so sore. I was in agony. And the minute that needle went into your arm, the pain just went away. So it was really hard on the third day when they came and said, OK, now you're going to get half a dose, then you're going to get a quarter of a dose, then you're going to get an eighth of a dose, then you're not going to get any. And throughout all that, you're just in agony because it hurts just like it did if they hadn't given you, you know, hadn't given you anything. But anyway, I worked through that. So on the fourth day in the hospital, and I've got this stupid body cast from here to here, General Leroy Manor, who was famous because he was the special ops commander at, at Hurlburt. <coughs> and he was the guy that did the famous Sante POW right. camp raid. General Manor walks into the room. He doesn't know me from Adam. I don't know him. He said, hey, Captain Jane, I just wanted to check on you, see how you're doing. I said, I'm fine. I said, thank you for doing that, sir. And he said, I want to make you an offer. I realize this has been a very traumatic event. And if you would like me to get you a change of assignment, I can make that happen instantly. And I said, sir, growing up in Missouri, when that horse threw you, the rule was you got back on that horse. I said, I'm going to go back and finish my five flights and go to the war in the A-1. And he said, I'm, I'm glad you said that. That's great. And as he starts to leave, he said, is there anything else I can do for you? And I said, well, it's very sweet of you to ask. I said, my wife's in good shape. She's down here with our daughter, and her mother's here. So, you know, she's got support. Her, you know, the mother-in-law came to visit. I said, but, sir, there is one thing you could do for me. I've got these two orthopedic doctors, one major and one captain, and I'm really not comfortable with the major, but he claims to be in charge. I'd really rather have the captain as my doctor and have him be the one that defines my treatment. And General Manor looks at me and says, well, that's easy. I'll do that, and walks out the door. So about an hour later, the captain, orthopedic doctor, walks in. And he says, what did you do? And I said, I just asked General Manor if I could have you be my doctor. And he said, I'm now your doctor. And he said, the cast's coming off tomorrow. <laughs> so that was the, that was the, and so I went back to Missouri on medical leave. Dear friend was the athletic director of the university, gave me full access to their, uh, you know, locker room, health room, fitness, weight room, all that stuff, whirl, full body whirlpool. And they're friends of mine in Kirksville, Missouri that remember this of watching me drag my right leg around the indoor track where I could hardly walk. From that to walking around the track and not limping, to then jogging around the track, to then running around the track. And that was between December 10th, 1970, and March 12th, 1971, I went back to NKP, I mean to uh, Hurlburt. The doctor, the, the, the captain flight surgeon says, take this, he gave me a little bitty brace that weighed less than a pound mm -hmm. that just was a, a, here and here, kept you from bending over and went, yeah. you know, went around your back. And the rule was, you don't have to wear it to bed, take it off to take a shower, but promise me you'll wear it all other times, including when you're working out. And I said, well, what can I not do working out? And he said, you can do anything working out as long as the pain's not too severe. And I said, well, that's the kind of doctor I like. So I basically would get in the whirlpool, and that would take the pain out of all the bone bruises, and then I'd work the joints and the muscles, and I, you know, I was in good shape. So I go back to him. He says, take the brace off. I'm in his office, I'd take it off. He says, touch your toes. 
remember it's my lower back that's broken. So I get to about 18 inches above my toes and my back, it doesn't hurt, it's just, I'm just stiff, I just can't. And he says, lie down on the floor, and pull your knees up, raise your legs up, loosen your back, you'll do it. I did this for about five minutes and went down and touched my toes. And he took the Air Force Form 1042, which is the medical, you know, flying, grounding or flying, signed me back on flying duty. And I went back to the squadron and they said, we're probably gonna give you five rides uh, to get you back even, and then we'll give you your last five rides. And I said, fine. After the second of those five rides, they said, if you're comfortable, we're just gonna give you the last five. I said, I'm comfortable. So I did seven flights and was on the next airplane to go to Thailand. So that, that's that story. That's but pe- amazing. But when people say, oh, and then, and then the accident report and, and the Yankee extraction system people said, Randy, you were out of the defined safe envelope. I was too low, too much angle of bank, you know, to survive. But I did because the, everything worked the way it was supposed to. But people said, we don't understand how you get out of the airplane that fast. I said, when you went up and did those torque rolls and realized that the minute that wing started down and you put in full controls, it was still going to go here. I, the minute that wing started down in the dark, I knew what the end of the movie was going to look like. And, and so I immediately pulled the handle. And so they figured that had I waited one more second, I would have just shot myself into the ground. Yep. But you didn't need to wait one more second if your brain said, you need to do this right now. Yep. Let's practice. Yeah. And that, it, it's preparation. Preparation. Yeah. yeah. Um, but had, had I had that training, that torque roll training, not been part of the syllabus, I wouldn't have lived through it. Here. I wouldn't yeah. be here. Because you, just, they, you know, I did it. I, we probably did it four times, maybe five times. And you mm-hmm. thought, okay, I've tried to stop this airplane. It's, it's at 135 degrees of bank, not completely upside down, but almost. And that's the end of this movie. Yep. That is fantastic. <laughs> Anything else that you would like to speak about? Um, yeah, I've got one more story for you that I sure. said a little bit at breakfast, and that was when we were working with the CIA in Laos, you never knew what to expect, but you knew to just relax and go do it. And it usually wasn't stuff that was really, really dangerous, but it was stuff where you knew you were in on something that nobody else knew about, and when you went back to the base, it wasn't something you were going to do a lot of a lot of talking about. So we get the daily schedule from Seventh Air Force in Saigon, the so-called FRAG, and it had a line, and it said ten o'clock in the morning, Hobo four four flight of two, with this ordinance and this fuel load, and take off and rendezvous to this point on the Luang Prabang. Tacan, which was the old royal capital of Laos, up in, if this is Laos, it's way up in the north central part, <coughs> it said rendezvous on this frequency. Okay. So I take off with young First Lieutenant Lance Smith on my wing, later four star General Lance Smith, and somebody that I knew would be very comfortable with whatever unusual things we were going to do. And we had no idea what we were going to do. So we fly up there, beautiful day, you can see for 100 miles, and we go to the frequency, and I'm contacted by an Air America Platus Porter. The Porter is a short takeoff and landing <coughs> Swedish, I think, uh, airplane that the that Air America flew a bunch of. And the guy says, Hobos, we're going to do a little bit of helicopter escort and a little bit of helicopter repair today. I said, okay. He says, just follow me and I'll tell you where we're going to rendezvous with the helicopters. And you knew when you did this that you didn't ask any questions. I mean, as long as what they said to you was something you could do and made sense, you, no questions got asked because they weren't going to answer them anyway. You know? And so we turn 90 degrees west. So we're in northern Laos headed west and we've got about... 100 miles of Laos. 
and I open my map up because I know exactly where we are and I'm looking at the ground and here's where we're flying along, flying west. And about 30 miles or 40 miles into this straight western flight, this little Air America Huey helicopter comes up and they're all silver, no insignia on them or anything, just a, just a tail number comes up and we start escorting him. And for us to escort him, we've got to weave like this and we're flying along and the, and the porter's flying at the same speed the helicopter is. So we're, you know, going over both of them. And I realize that on that page of my map, that when I get to the Laotian border, within 15 or 20 miles into Burma, I no longer have a map. It's the, it's the end of my map. And there's no sign of us slowing down as we're heading in that direction. And by this time, we lose the Luang Prabang Takan. So we don't have any navigation aid, and I don't have any idea. I know there are no Takan. Takan's a military, they're none in Burma. You know, they're not. They're not our buddies. Um, and so we're flying along, and I say to Lance Smith on our FM radio, where the CIA guys can't hear me, I say, this is going to be interesting. Let's keep track of where we are. My map ends here, and Lance said, my map ends there too. And I turned the map over, and on the back of the acetate-covered map was just a white page. And I take my grease pencil, and start drawing the terrain I see. So we fly 60 miles into Burma, and I know it's 60 miles because I start timing when I flew across the border, which I could tell, I mean, I could tell where we were by looking out. We fly 60 miles into Burma, and the porter says, our destination is right ahead at one o'clock on the top of that ridge line. And here's one of these classic Special Forces hard sites with the perimeters around it way up on the ridge and a fairly good sized dirt helipad cleared obviously by a bulldozer <clears throat> and there's a Huey sitting there. And so our Huey goes in and lands right beside the other Huey. And the CIA guy says, I'm going to get far outside of you guys circle and just circle you watch, and if these guys start taking any fire, we will give you directions as to mortar or RPGs or whatever, and you're cleared to, to, you know, to shoot back at anything on any side that there's, there's no friendlies you know, around this thing. And so we're watching this helicopter, and these guys take out one of these little tripod winches and they swing a Huey engine, which is about jet, you know, out of the helicopter we were escorting and start opening it. They're replacing the engine on this Huey. So we're up there circling for two hours. The second Huey that's on the ground, yeah, is yeah. that an Air America Huey they're, as well? Okay, yeah, they're, so bo they're, bo the they're both Air America Hueys. Right. And, and the second one is bringing a replacement engine for the first one. So <clears throat> we're watching this, and I knew that good Huey guys could change an engine in an, in an hour and 10 minutes or you know something like that. It wasn't a long time, so we're watching. And pretty soon they and they put the old engine back in the second Huey, and all of a sudden the the broken helicopters rotors start turning, so they're starting up the replacement engine, and they get running, and you see the guy do a classic hover check where he just went up six feet and sat there and turned one way and turned the other way and went back down. Then you see people come out from inside the buildings and get in the two helicopters and and they're putting fuel in the one that we were escorting because he'd used some up so they're pumping it by hand in a and 50. he's still running so they're doing hot fueling. Well no he's not he's shut down. It's it's shut down. The, okay. other, the, the one they fixed is running but they'd already he was already full Pumped of gas. Okay. So we take off we escort the two of them straight back where we came and meanwhile I have drawn 
a very good map, because I pride myself on being a decent artist, <coughs> of the terrain, and I've got a circle around, you know, where we were. And again, going back outbound, we time it trying to figure out exactly how far in we were. My two numbers matched within a half a mile, so you, you know you knew where you were. So we get back into the middle of Laos, and the guy says, thank you, and the Hueys go off, and you know, you're released. So we went, found a Raven, did a normal strike mission, went back to NKP, and when we went into the intel center to debrief in the command post, one of my young lieutenant women intel officers comes in to debrief us, and I said, Sherry, don't take this the wrong way, but we just had an unusual mission, and I need you to go get your boss, and he's the one that needs to debrief us. And she says, oh, okay, and then, 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 you know, goes off. Here comes the lieutenant colonel, so she leaves. We close the door, and I said, Lance, show the intel chief where we were. And I had written down, looking at the map, the, the military eight-digit coordinates of where I thought we were. <clears throat> Lance goes up and puts a grease circle around the exact, the exact same spot that I have in, in 60 miles into Burma. And this guy looks at us and says, what? And so we tell him the story and we said, we're going to fill out this mission debrief about the strike mission on the plane of jars with the Ravens in support of General Vang Pao's troops, and we're not gonna say anything about the rest of it. And he said, I understand, that's fine. I said, we just wanted to be sure we, we, you know, we, were, we were doing this right, and that was the end of it. But to this day, Lance Smith and I think we're the only two A-1 pilots that ever flew a combat mission in Burma. Holy cow. And I mean, that's just another one of those moments in the war where just something crazy happens. And, and 40 years later, with Tim Castle, who wrote One Day Too Long, when Nancy and I lived in McLean, I was on an advisory panel at CIA, five miles down the road, and Tim Castle was one of the CIA historians. And so I would stop by and visit Tim when I would go into the building. You know, getting in the building is a big deal, but once you're inside, you know, I'd go visit with Tim. And I said, here's what happened. Here's where we were, and I could still remember it on the map. What's the explanation? And he said, well, <clears throat> it's probably written down someplace in the history, but the agency had relationships with a lot of those tribal chieftains particularly in eastern Burma, who were very independent, who were very anti-communist, so we liked them. They had no loyalty to the main government in Rangoon, but they controlled their territory, and it was probably us doing a social, required social visit to one of those guys with some of our senior people, and the helicopter broke. And they needed to get the helicopter fixed, but they were worried that they'd drawn attention from the communist Burmese insurgents and didn't want to have a problem with either the people or the two helicopters. So that's why you guys were there. And obviously, you didn't, your presence alone, you know, which it usually did, caused the bad guys to say, no, this is not a day we're going we're gonna to shoot at the helicopters. So that was, that was what the, the reasonably explanation was. Wow. And then you've gone on, your career, uh, can you tell me where you went FDA one briefly and kind of wrap up where, where your career was? Yeah, I, I really had had two parallel careers. I volunteered to go back for a second tour mm -hmm. <coughs> and flew a tour in the F-4 out of Karat, Thailand in the 34 Squadron, which had been a famous F-105s over North Vietnam squadron until they went home in the end of 70 and were replaced by F-4s in the same squadron who kept, who did that in the linebacker. But anyway, when I flew that tour and went home, I wanted to go to any F-4 flying unit in the world, and I could have been an instructor. Uh, with the time I had in the A-1 and the F-4, and I'd been a T-38 instructor. Um, and TAC wouldn't do that, and I got mad and was going to get out of the Air Force, and General Brent Scowcroft, retired Air Force Lieutenant General, 
was President Ford's national security advisor in the White House. And he had known me from two years before between my two tours. I had been a white, served in the White House Fellows Program, which is a one year, like an internship mm -hmm. in the White House. And I'd worked with General Scowcroft. Well, he brought me back to the National Security Council staff. So I was an Air Force officer on the NSC staff. And I like to tell people I had the same job on the NSC staff that Oliver North did, except I did it according to the Constitution and the laws of the United States, unlike Lieutenant Colonel North. Um, but I did that until President Carter was elected. And when that happened, his budget director, Bert Lance, offered me the job to be the Associate Director for National Security, which was the defense budget, the intelligence budget, and the foreign affairs budget. So that was one third of the whole federal budget. I was responsible for analyzing those budgets, reporting to the president, and then implementing whatever the president said to do on adjusting whatever the departments asked for. So I resigned my commission in early 1977 joined the Air National Guard and went out to Andrews. So while I was working in the White House for President Carter as a civilian, I was flying the F-105 Thunder Chief for three and a half years in the District of Columbia Air National Guard. And so I left that summer before, I left the summer of the election of 80 before Carter lost the election, but I left, went to work for General Dynamics in St. Louis and joined the Missouri Air Guard flying again the F-4 that I'd flown a Vietnam tour in. And then after almost eight years at GD, went to McDonnell Douglas across town in St. Louis, ended up running the F-15 program and helped bring the F-15 into the Missouri Air Guard in uh, 1988, 1989. And so I got to fly the Eagle that I was also building in my day job, fly it in the guard from 89 through 95 when I stopped flying because uh, we moved back to Washington and I couldn't keep doing that. And General Don Shepard, who was the Air Guard commander, made me the first ever Air National Guard assistant to Air Force Space Command. Now, the neat thing about that is when I talked to, to General Shepard about retiring as a colonel, he said, no, I want you to take that job. And I said, well, you don't have an Air National Guard assistant to Space Command. He said, no, but if you'll, because I've been working space programs at both McDonnell Douglas and GD. He said, if you'll take the job, you'll have it. And I said, well, that's a two-star general job. And he said, yes, that's right. I said, okay, forget what I said about retiring. <laughs> so I literally went in to retire and walked out on the general officers list. And so I did that for five more years, no more flying. I flew my last F-15 flight in December of 95. Uh, and I retired from the Guard in December of 2000, five years later. And the neat thing I was able to accomplish, Rich, and it's the reason that General Shepard sent me out there, was Space Command had 12,000 officers and enlisted people. They had no Air National Guard presence. We converted three major Space Command mission areas to Air National Guard missions. And when I left, we had 3,200 Guardsmen in Space Command out of that 12,000. So I, it was, I, was, I had a business development job, if you want to think about it that way. And it was very successful because the Guard guys in in Colorado and Wyoming and California and Florida did a remarkable job and, and had more technical expertise to bring to Space Command than the much younger rookie active, active duty people that had been doing these jobs. And so all these units' readiness and performance went up because of the technical capability uh, in the Guard family of people that worked for you know, Raytheon and Northrop and Honeywell as their, you know, as their day job and, and were guardsmen on the weekend. So it allowed a greater uh, pool of working knowledge to be utilized yeah. in, in the theoretical field of some of those places. You brought a lot of experience yeah. yes, into and, those organizations. Yeah, and what, what I was able to do, it really was 
a sales and marketing job because there were a lot of, you know, I used to say that people think fighter pilots are arrogant because they're very capable of doing something really hard and really challenging and they know it. They're nowhere near as arrogant as the leadership of the Air Force Space Command world because those people are, are rocket scientists, really, and they know it. Uh, and the, the, the Space Command attitude when I got there was the guards a bunch of dumb weekend warriors, they couldn't possibly do this. Well, you know, the unit I flew with in St. Louis, I had McDonnell Douglas test pilots in the unit. I said, these aren't normal people. The, the, you know, we're pretty picky in the guard. There's so, some exceptional people. Yeah, so, so the three major missions that we had were two wartime mobile backup satellite control missions where these people would drive their trucks out into the desert or forest and they could control the satellites if the ground station that was a fixed station got blown up or got taken off the air. And so it wasn't something that had to be done every day. So it was perfect for the guard. Yeah. And then the other one was launching, launching the Air Force's missiles from the east and west coast and the guard launch teams were on each coast one of three teams and so they only had to do every third launch so again it was perfect mission for the guard where you could tell somebody okay in two months you need to be able to take two months or two weeks of military leave to come do this launch and so it was it was perfect for the so you've guard. So you got redundancy systems yes from what they had that that's brilliant yeah and and uh, for example both of these mobile satellite command things were, if you think about it, you know, if you have a part break on an F-15 or an F-4, there's thousands of those parts around and they're produced because they're in all those airplanes and all those crew chiefs know how to fix that and all the avionic shops, you know. Well, this remote satellite control stuff was all unique, one-of-a-kind stuff. And we had pieces of equipment that the Air Force would keep working 15% of the time. And our guardsmen in Colorado and Wyoming in these two units had them working 95% of the time. And half of the way they did it was if you looked at the circuit card that they repaired, the three components that they'd replaced, they got it from Radio Shack. In other words, they knew that the military supply system did not support that but they also knew what they needed and they knew how to go to the electronics market and ask and Radio Shack said, oh, we'll get you one of those, you know. And so it was that kind of guard inventiveness and ingenuity that was, was very good. That's amazing. I have never even had a glimpse of that, yeah. that that had happened. And think of where we are today. Well, yeah, and the interesting thing today is they're having an argument in the Congress that says, do we need to create a, a space national guard and those of us that were in the air national guard and particularly me having been in the middle of getting us into this said that's the stupidest thing in the world you don't need that you just you just have air guardsmen working for the for the space force yep. just like they've got people from other services where you know they, they're the same people don't don't make them create a new organization so they can keep doing the same job that they're doing um, let's see, I had one last question I was going to ask, I guess. Last question. Favorite aircraft that you've ever flown? That's a tough one because you've got oh. quite a span in there, but... I, personally, that's an impossible question. I'll tell okay. you why. Um, most pilots will tell you the first airplane they flew in combat will always be their favorite. And the A-1 was such an absolutely amazing airplane. And I was able to do things in that airplane in terms of accurately dropping ordnance and things that I know saved people's lives, mm -hmm. you know. And so that's an amazing favorite. Um, I then, in the Guard, got to fly the F-105, which, of course, I didn't get to fly in combat, and a number of my older Academy grad buddies did. It was an amazing airplane. I've got my weapons scores from four years in the F-105, which are all significantly better than 10 years in the F-4. That's how much more accurate the airplane was. Okay. 
Then I flew a combat tour in the F-4, and I flew 10 years in the F-4, and I love that airplane. I could walk out and get in an F-4 today with my eyes closed and start it up and take off and go to the range and drop bombs and, and go fly air to air. And come. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's, it, there. It, it's there. Uh, and then I got to fly the Eagle for six years, which is an absolutely amazing airplane, and I got to build them. So I have a real heart felt attachment and I can't pick one. yeah well and, and I'm not finished because between my A1 tour and my F4 tour I spent a year and a half as a T38 instructor pilot and out there with those guys yesterday at Randolph that is an amazing little airplane and I loved it I mean it would be I'd love to have one parked in my garage it was it was so fast it was so agile but it was so easy to fly and so I, you know, I, the A1 would be my love, but all, there's a lot of other loves there, a lot of other girlfriends there. <laughs> that's a great way to put it. That's so great. how about if you take me back to the events of how you wound up visiting Utapau when oh, the sure. four Sky Raiders came I, I was flying in the 34th TAC Fighter Squadron at Karat, Thailand. And the date and on this it is? Was, is April of 1975, so it's when Saigon fell. And I had been to Clark Air Force Base. Sorry. I moved that. I thought you That's were going to okay. stand up earlier. Yeah. Let's start over. All right. Uh, I was in the 34th TAC Fighter Squadron at Karat, flying the F-4. And I had been at Clark because now that we weren't flying combat missions every day, we got to go over there and shoot live air-to-air -air, uh, AIM-7 and AIM-9 missiles. And so I'd been over there doing that at Clark and got on the C-141 uh, because what we did is took a couple of airplanes over there and left them and then our pilots and whizzos went over and flew them and left the airplanes there. So I'm coming home on the 141 and the first place it lands is Utapau. And this is whatever that date was, 20-something of April, um, 1975, and the C-141 aircraft commander says, we're going to have to completely refuel the airplane. Let's all go into base ops and get a sandwich, and we'll just plan on being on the ground for like an hour and 15 minutes. So we all go in and get a sandwich and walk outside, and it's a beautiful day, and we're standing around, and I'm standing there with 30 people I don't know, well, except my backseater is with me, I mean, the two of us. And I hear this noise, and I listen, and I listen, and I turn my head, and I said, those are A-1 Sky Raiders. Well, the, the sound of that RD-3350 big recip is very unique, and with the very short exhaust stacks, it was a rumble that you could hear for miles and miles. And of course, I said, those are A1s. And the guys standing around me are going, the guys and gals going, what are you talking about? That's... About this time, we look over the horizon and here come four Sky Raiders. And they were VNAF A1s who had fled uh, Tonsonut uh, and taken off. And they were, the airplanes were full of family members and we watched them come in and land, and to their credit, the Air Force SAC base security people realized what it was, realized they needed to get them out a little bit separate from everybody else where they could keep people away from them, and uh, they start taxiing in. Well, I start walking over there out in the middle of a ramp, and the SAC security guys with their M16 stop me, and I've got my line badge from Karat that's a full access, you know, any area on the base kind of thing. And I said, hey, I'm cleared. And I flew that airplane. And that was all. The guy just <laughs> immediately let me through. Well, these guys shut down. And the first airplane was an H and looked pretty run down from the outside because they'd been fighting for, you know, months without being able to take much care of those airplanes. Pilot opens the cock, opens the, cock, <clears throat> the canopy back, takes his helmet off, and I look up, and it's a guy that I went through Hurlburt training with, VNAF pilot. 
and he recognized me, and I recognized because he's trying to figure out what I'm doing standing at Utapau. That doesn't, you know, that doesn't compute. But he then unfolds his hundred pound wife from around him and helps her out of the cockpit. If you've ever seen the inside of an A1H, it is very tight, and she was lying across his lap with her most of her chest and head on the right hand side console and her knees, ankles, feet on the left hand side where the throttles and the radio controls were. And she had to lie there, you know, all the time he's flying. I'm sure she was you How know, long do you think that flight was for them to get to you? It was probably two hours. So, so she it, laid there for, for two, two for two hours. And then Two of the other airplanes were, were A1Es with the blue room behind, and all the dozens of people were getting out of those because that was just, you know, there was plenty of room for them. It was just weight. Um, and I climbed up on the wing after the guy got out, and it's interesting because these security police made no effort to stop me because I got my pilot wings on and I got my line badge, and they figured I knew what I was doing. There were instruments missing out of the instrument panel. The uh, Yankee extraction system was fully pinned, and I realized the reason it was fully pinned was it wasn't, it, it wasn't functional. Some of the, the lines weren't even connected, so he had no, no parachute, no escape system uh, at all. But we, we watched these people, and then I realized I needed to go get back on the airplane because I needed to go back to Karat. Well, two days later, the phone rings, and it's Roger Youngblood who says, Randy, we've got these four A1s at Utapau. I said, Roger, I'm way ahead of you. I was standing there when they landed. He said, oh, okay. He said, well, we need to go down and fly them up to uh, Coca TM or it was top lead, wasn't it? Yeah, to someplace, yeah. Uh, and you need to come help us. I said, Roger, I climbed all over those airplanes. I'm not going to go fly one of those airplanes. <laughs> I said, that's not a good idea. And I said, beside, I'm not sure my wing commander would, you know, let me do that anyway. He says, okay, well, we'll take So as you know the story, he and his friend. Jack Drummond. Yeah, Jack Drummond, you know, went down and, and took by, care of that. By the time they got there, there were 12 A1s sitting there. Oh, wow. And um, he wound up, he found a crew chief, and he said, you know, we got to start getting these out of there. So they started with the best of the best that were in the least of the worst shape. Right. Yeah, exactly. And they got four out. Well, they got all the F5s out. They were smuggling everything they could for Adderholt. So Adderholt sent them in to get everything out that they could. He did not want that to fall into the hands of the North Oh, yeah. Marines. And he was, he was a hero for doing that because the Thais felt politically obligated that they somehow needed to give them back if something, you know, something didn't... Uh, work out. It yeah. didn't happen. So, uh, yeah, and it, it was an amazing story. So I've got another quick story about the Thais. At Don Mong Airport in Bangkok was a, a company called Thai Am, and Thai Am was the depot overhaul facility for A1s in the theater. And they would basically take an airplane and take it down, scrape the paint off, repaint it, and so the airplanes that came back to NKP from from Thai Am and Don Mong looked like new airplanes, smelled like new airplanes. So I got sent down one day to get one. So I fly down on our little C-123 and and get a Jeep and go across to the Thai Am guys. And here's this beautiful A-1. And the Thais were very sensitive about warplanes at Don Mong. So the airplane, before it left NKP, they took the four 20 millimeter cannons out of the wings and there was just duct tape over the holes, and they actually took the bomb pylons off the underside of the wing. So the underside of the wing is slick, except for the two big pylons, and all this airplane had on it, we didn't have any centerline tank. So it was completely clean and slick wings and no guns. And I thought, well, now this is a hot rod. This will be fun, you know, to fly back. And I get in this airplane, it smells like a new airplane, and I'm checking the Yankee system in particular, and everything looks good. And I start it up, and then great running engine. They've completely rebuilt the engine. 
and I taxi out at Don Mong and we put in two degrees of right rudder trim that helped you when you put in full right rudder. It gave you a little more rudder to help you on the torque and I thought, well, I've got a super light airplane. I'm not even going to go to full power because I can't control the torque if I do. So I go out there. I'm in an international airport, you know, Pan Am and you know, Lufthansa and everybody are coming in and out. And they clear me to take off and I release the brakes and very slowly come up with the power and I start to roll and the plane starts going to the left with the torque and I've got full right stick and full right rudder and I'm tapping the right brake and the airplane's still going to the left and I pull the throttle back and I'm sitting like this now and I turn back around and I said tower let me go back around and try that again and they said fine you're clear do you runway there's two runways and yeah. nobody was behind me so I go back out this time I really go gently and I start to roll and as I start to get a little speed I start going left again and I'm and I don't want to burn the brake out and I'm hitting it and I'm still going left so I pull it back and stop and I'm not going very fast taxi back and I said tower let me just taxi off the runway for a minute and figure out what's going on so I opened the canopy <clears throat> mash the right rudder full down turn around and look at the trim tab on the rudder the two degrees and it's a big trim tab yeah it's pointing the wrong way oh no so I looked down at the gauge and I reached down to the gauge and without looking at the rudder went two degrees left trim, which would kill you, Yeah. pushed in on the rudder, turned around and it looked exactly like it was supposed to. Oh. And I thought somebody has crossed those two. reversed those two wires. So I said, Tower, I'm ready to do this again. And they said, fine. I taxied out. Ran up, it was the smoothest takeoff in the world, just exactly like it should have happened. And so as you get up, you take that rudder trim out. So I fly back to NKP at like 14,000 feet, and instead of going the 140 knots that we went in a normal A1 at cruise power with all the ordnance, I'm cruising at about 260 at the same low power setting. I mean, this airplane is flying because it's got no drag yeah, under the wind. Just, and I thought, ooh. This is a hot rod. This would be this would be good to fly in an air show if you're not if you're not carrying all that drag. So I get back to NKP, come in and land, taxi in, and of course because it's coming back from Iran, the chief of maintenance is a colonel, and everybody's out there to look at the airplane, and the crew chief who was glad to get his airplane back says, "Randy, how how's my airplane?" And I said, "Your airplane is perfect, except you've got a five minute job to do." And he said, "What's that?" And I said you need to change the leads on the rudder trim. And he said, you mean reverse them? And I said, yeah, it's backwards. And he goes, what? And we're sitting there and they plug the thing in so the battery. I said, watch it. And I put it two degrees right. I said, what's that say? He says, two degrees right. I said, look at the trim. He says, oh my gosh, it's backwards. <laughs> so that, so they fixed it. But I thought that was interesting that here I am on an international airport embarrassing myself because I can't keep the damn airplane on the runway. And I'm thinking, I'm not doing this wrong, am I? And that was, that was what the problem was. And it took me, and from that, I learned from that day on every airplane I ever flew after that, F-105, F-4, F-15, I always checked the rudder trim position visually looking out the cockpit <laughs> before I did anything else. That's amazing. Good gosh. I, the, well, it seems like you've run into circumstances here and there that have taught you lessons and you've learned very quickly and, and you've built a system that yeah. has kept you alive in some very challenging situations. Well, that's right. And, and you want to be sure that if you have the choice of stopping and counting to 10 and tr like in this case, I thought, I'm not going to take off this airplane. I don't, there's nothing making me take off of this airplane. I, I got to figure out what's wrong with this airplane. Well, the minute I figured it out, then the decision I had to make is do I taxi back in and get it fixed? Or do I believe what I see with my eyeballs that it's just backwards and yep. just fly it that way, which I did and it was fine and there was no problem, but those things happen. 
And, oh and then the other one, we were striking with the Raven way up east of the PDJ. And one of the two controlling airborne people, either the 121 Air Force thing or the Navy cruiser that tracked us, mm -hmm. calls me on the radio on guard and says, Hobo 44, this is Red Crown or whatever the call sign was. Um, you have a hostile target, uh, 040 at 40 miles, you're clear to engage. Well, now later flying the F-4 and the F-15, I, you know, we did those kind of things, but when I'm this young A-1 pilot, what am I doing again? He says, you got a hostile target, you're clear to engage. And I said, okay. And he says, well, are you Alpha Delta equipped? And I said, said to Bob Herklotz, my wingman, what's that mean? I have no idea what the guy was talking about. And I said, be specific. And he said, are you air defense equipped? And I said, yeah, we got eight 20 millimeter cannons and four pods of rockets. And he said, all right, you, you know, you're, you're cleared to engage. And I said, what's the airspeed of the bandit? And he says, 65 knots, which tells me it's a helicopter. And I said, okay. So we go racing into North Vietnam at 106, we'd already dropped our CBUs and things, so we're going faster than normal, maybe 160, maybe 170, and we're, so we're very, you know, we got 100 miles an hour overtake, basically. Yeah. And it's really hazy, and the guy says, target's at 12 miles, target's at 10 miles, target's at eight miles, and, and I said to Herc, I said, there's no way we're gonna see this guy until we're within three miles of him. It was just too hazy. Well, we get about the five mile point and the controller says, target, we lost contact with the bogey. So he, he, he what he did was he landed. Mm -hmm. So we just counted three more miles and, and turned and looked and couldn't see anything. It was, it was a valley. Mm -hmm. And now people start shooting at us because we're in the middle of North Vietnam. And so we, you know, turn around and start home. The next thing we know, the guy says, you have two MiG-17s chasing you. Of course, we're going 170 and they're going 400, <laughs> you know, so they're so catching us very, very quickly. So we waited till he called them at five miles and we just turned around and pointed at them and they both tried to turn in on us. And I don't think Bob Herklotz's MIG ever saw him. I could tell my guy saw me because he's turning on me. And I'm thinking, you're not gonna shoot me because I'm gonna be pointing right at you when it, by the time you get turned around. And so he turns around and I'm pointed right at him but can't take a shot. And he goes by me and I turn around and look and Herklotz pushes the button down on the, the Lao 3 pod of 19 rockets. Yeah in Ripple and 19 rockets go out and this MIG's going like this and the rockets went right in front of him <laughs> and the guy immediately turned and they, they turned around and went home. And that was, that was the end of it. But those were two crazy missions that had nothing to do with SARS, that had nothing to do with prairie fires, that had nothing to do with close air support, but shows you how weird it was you know, from Burma to, to, a, to a MIG encounter in the middle of North Vietnam where I'm chasing a helicopter and thinking, nowhere in my training did anybody ever tell me about how to chase and shoot down a helicopter. So they must have had uh, radar yes. knowing that you were coming in after the helicopter. That's probably where the MIGs came from. Yes. Too, so. you, well, and see, those guys knew where we were and what my call sign was because the Mode 1 IFF you squawked your call sign. Mm -hmm. And so he knew that that was Hobo 44, and so that's how he knew where we were. And that's the way the GCI site, like at NKP, could have. And that was good because we'd get in places over there in North Vietnam and, and Laos where we had no tack in. And if the weather was bad, where you couldn't see the ground and you couldn't, you know, you didn't have any way of knowing where you were, you could often ask the GCI site, say, 
you know, give me a give me a quick location from Invert was the call sign at NKP of the GCI guys. And Invert, give me a quick location to home, and the guy would say, you know, zero five zero at eighty three miles. So you knew exactly he knew exactly where you were, and you knew exactly where you were. That's pretty interesting because a lot of the guys that I've been in here, I said, well, did you know where you were? And and one of the guys said. Hell, if I knew it was all green. He said we were just in the middle of green. They get you'd, you'd you'd fly to a heading and a point and whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he said you'd go off a of delta points and then tack in. And now tack in is is it tactical antenna? Is that what that stands for? What is tack in? Tact- tactical air navigation. Okay, all right. T A C A N, and the tack in gave you a bearing back to the station and your distance. It's called DME, distance measuring equipment. Uh, gave you bearing and DME, but when you got down low and you were far away from the tack hands, and and what happened before I got there, there used to be a, a secret site. Uh, if you've heard the, if you've read Tim Castle's book One Day Too Long, uh, Lima Site Eighty Five yes. up in okay, they had this uh, top of that car. Yeah, they had a a, a sack. RBS, radar bomb system thing, that SAC used to score their airplane training nuke deliveries. It was basically a radar. So it knew exactly where the airplane was, altitude, speed, heading, and if the guy said, I just released, then the RBS would say that's where the bomb's going to hit. And it was very accurate. So we were using it to guide F-4s, F-105s, Navy A-6s in the weather to drop in North Vietnam, and the North Vietnamese had no idea that was what was going on. What the you know the value of the site. Well, there was also a TACAN on on uh, channel on Lima 85, and so when it fell. We lost that tack in, which meant that, like when Ron Smith flew Oyster, he had no tack in help at all. It was right on the border, so it would get you into North Vietnam when it was there. But that was either '68 or '69 that that fell. So once that was gone, you were, you know, you I'm were operating without. Yeah. That's a great story. <laughs> well, Randy, thank you again so much for sitting down with me. This has been fantastic. When you said we were going to need three, four hours, you were thinking, <laughs> this has been just, I mean, as you were going through the SARS, I'm like, you know, and I've only heard of one other SAR where they use smoke canisters, and it was Botra 2-2, where they were right. just building the cruise. Yeah, right. And they also used the uh, Bluey. Bluey 52, yeah, yeah. Because that wound up, uh, some of that hit Woody Bergeron. Oh, and so he can tell you what oh, it was he's like. he's like, it was just <laughs> awful, yeah. you know, and he's like, you know, he just, he wrote it out, and... Uh, well, and the thing on Nail 3-1, given the fact that I had the best wingman in the world in Colonel Jack Robinson, I marked with a Willie Pete and said, boss, lay your smoke first. His was absolutely perfect. I mean, it was within 10 feet of where it wanted to be. And I, I remember saying to myself as I'm going back and getting lined up to put in the other side of the corridor, don't screw this up, Randy, because the boss did it perfectly, <laughs> and, and, he's and he's watching, and you better do it as well as he did, and, I, and mine was pretty good, so it, was a, it ended up as a good corridor. Well, that's great. One. Fast movers in the night need search and rescue at first light. Hey, beeper, come up, boys. Now get your young ass on that horse. We took big errors on this star. This could be my silver star. We bring Charlie Green. Thank you.